he reports directly to Secretary Pompeo and leads all U.S. policy um, to combat anti-Semitism all around the world. He was a DA in Los Angeles, where he prosecuted major crimes and hate crimes. Um, he's an officer in the U.S. Army Reserve uh, for the last 20 years, deployed to Iraq, and uh, helped uh, establish the Iraqi judiciary um, and helped train uh, judges and lawyers on, um, on the justice system. And probably my favorite thing about Elon is that he actually led Jewish services in you know, Saddam Hussein's former presidential palace. So uh, pretty interesting. Um, and he was also previously the international president of AEPI, um, was on the National Council of APAC, and was a voting member of the uh, Conference of Presidents of Major Jewish Organizations. So uh, he's got a very distinguished career and background, and uh, we're thrilled that he's representing our interests in the U.S. government and abroad, and we're happy to have him here tonight to talk about um, how to combat anti-Semitism. So I'll turn it over to Ambassador Carr. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to be with my dear friends of the ZOA. <clears throat> I have to acknowledge your leadership. Uh, Mark, my good friend, Mark Levinson. Uh, Judy, thank you. You know, uh, young professionals are so very important for the future of, uh, of not only the organizational community, but really for the future of, of our country, for the future of the Jewish people. And so thank you, Judy, for your leadership. Of course, Mort Klein, the legend, uh, it's uh, always, always, uh, you know, I, I'm just always so grateful for uh, so many things that Mort does. <clears throat> and, uh, and then lastly, to all of you, you know, where, um, you know, you, that, that you would take time out of your evening uh, to spend time not only with me, but really to spend time uh, in dedication to the future that you want to bring, the future that you want to see, the issues about which uh, you care. And, and now as, as I scan the virtual room, I, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar uh, names. My, uh, my AEPI brother, Lou Boucher, I see is on, which is always a pleasure and, and so many others. So thank you all very much. Lastly, Michael, I have to say, uh, Michael and I became great friends right after my appointment. We, we met soon after I was appointed envoy and, and we've been great friends ever since. And so it was really a special pleasure, Michael, to have you introduce me, thank you. You know, I, um, <clears throat> I'm uh, uh, just thrilled to be with you tonight. I'm especially thrilled to bring you greetings from the President of the United States um, and from my boss, Secretary uh, of State, Mike Pompeo, two leaders who have made the fight against anti-Semitism and the fight for the Jewish people in the state of Israel a top national priority for our country. Um, I was appointed by President Trump and Secretary Pompeo now two years ago almost to help lead America's fight against this pernicious, recurring, tireless human sickness, often called the world's oldest hatred, that is anti-Semitism. And I took this appointment at a time of rising anti-Semitism throughout the world. We're seeing anti-Semitism rise from the, the ethnic supremacist far right. We see it rising from the radical Israel-hating anti-Zionist left, and we see it rising from militant Islam. And so I'd like to just give a quick overview of the priorities and the lines of effort on which my team and I have been focused over the last two years and, uh, and they'll continue to be our focus going forward. First of all, physical safety. Physical safety has gotta be job one. It's the sovereign's first responsibility to its citizenry. And so I am focused on ensuring that every Jewish community around the world is safe and protected. If you don't have safety, if you can't leave your house and know that you're protected or, or put your, your kids on a school bus and know that, that, that they're gonna come back in one piece, you cannot live that way. And so physical safety of Jewish communities is job one. I've worked throughout the world with our allies and partners to ensure that Jewish communities are protected. And right here at home in the United States, thank God our administration has doubled down on this effort with the nonprofit security grant program through the Department of Homeland Security to make sure that Jews are protected throughout the world. A second priority globally is hate crimes. As uh, Michael said, I used to prosecute hate crimes. It is so important for the law enforcement community to make that statement that a crime committed with the motivation of ethnic or religious hatred, targeting an ethnic group or, or a religious group is worse 
is more blameworthy and, and more deserving of, of more severe punishment. And so these hate crime enhancements that we know so well in the United States are critically important. I was, uh, uh, had a great, great privilege of meeting with law enforcement leaders from seven separate German states where we talked about real solutions to hate crime prosecution. You might know in Europe, there were some uh, just devastating results where, where uh, hate crimes charges were dismissed by judges. In one case, in a, in a murder case, dismissed because I would argue of insufficient training uh, in the law enforcement world. But not only overseas, I've met with law enforcement leaders right here at home uh, in Lakewood, in Jersey City and other places to talk about how law enforcement can respond when anti-Semitism does rise to the level of crime. So important. A third priority for us is the definition of anti-Semitism. And folks, this is so important. You know, if you want to confront a threat effectively, you've got to define it first. This is something that any army officer knows, and it's something that is common sense. All of us can understand that. Well, we have a definition. It's an accepted international definition. It's the definition of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, or IRA, definition of anti-Semitism. And it is a top priority. The power of this definition is that in the examples it gives, it encompasses not only traditional medieval Jew hatred, you know, Jews controlling the world or responsible for, for you know, every, every uh, human malady in the world, but it also in those examples embraces and encompasses the more contemporary kinds of anti-Semitism, the Israel hatred, the anti-Zionism that we know is so threatening to the Jewish people today. So an example given in the IRA definition, denying the Jewish people self-determination, for example, by claiming that the existence of a state of Israel is a racist endeavor, an example of anti-Semitism, uh, targeting the state of Israel as a Jewish collective, an example of anti-Semitism, subjecting the state of Israel to a double standard not demanded of any other democracy in the world, an example of anti-Semitism, comparing Israel to Nazi Germany, an example of anti-Semitism. So the power of the IRA definition is it allows us to point to an objective, accepted, non-controversial definition and say, you know, what you're saying, what you're doing is anti-Semitism. And it's not my opinion. I'm going to point to an objective standard. This is so very important. And one of my top diplomatic asks when I go overseas, if a country has not adopted it, we ask that they do so. Now, on this front, let me tell you, we are in a different world, thanks to the leadership of President Trump and Secretary Pompeo. Um, just last Thursday evening, I concluded an agreement with the Kingdom of Bahrain's King Hamad Global Center to combat anti-Semitism together. Imagine it, the first Arab entity joining with us to fight anti-Semitism in the Middle East and beyond. And in that memorandum of agreement, we uh, referenced and, and accepted the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. So the first Arab entity to embrace the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. And then just yesterday, an historic day-long conference was held in, in Tirana, virtually in Tirana, by the Republic of Albania, the first Muslim majority country to adopt the IRA definition by formal parliamentary action. Uh, Kosovo did it by executive action before. President Trump did it in December by executive order. And so great things are happening thanks to US leadership. More and more countries are adopting the IRA definition and we're focusing on campuses next. How important it is that universities adopt that definition of anti-Semitism. Uh, the other priority for us is the internet and social media. Anti-Semitism has been rising for over a decade now. Why? I'm always asked, why is it that 75 years after the Holocaust ended, is anti-Semitism again on the march and again on the rise? How is it possible? Well, the answer is, the prime answer is, that the haters from the, from the far right, the radical left, militant Islam, all three find common purpose in Jew hatred and are using the same tactics the internet and social media to propagate this venom. And it's giving these haters uh, the power and the global reach to spread their ideologies with unprecedented speed. And so that's what's happening in the, in, in the internet and social media, we're seeing Jew hatred being spread. And as bad as it is on social media and on the so-called visible web, once you enter the, the dark catacombs of the deep web, the fringe, sites of hate, let me tell you, it's absolutely terrifying. The, uh, 
the uh, uh, slight veil of anonymity accorded these people brings out the most unadulterated venom. And I have to tell you, I was, I was uh, appalled uh, to, to, to see with my eyes the kind of things that are said and posted, the kind of memes that we see on the dark web, but on social media too. Look, in the first eight months of 2020, on Twitter and YouTube alone, just those two, 1.7 million anti-Semitic posts were registered. And so this is a great problem. And this has been a, a top focus for my team and me. I'm proud to say that just last week, uh, we broadcast the first ever United States government-sponsored conference dedicated to combating online anti-Semitism. It's never before happened. Secretary Pompeo hosted it and opened it. Uh, thought leaders from around the world joined with us to talk about how we can, we can craft tangible solutions to countering the, the torrents, the deluge of online hate. So this is a key point for us. And then finally, a final priority is it's not enough to be defensive when confronting anti-Semitism. You have to defend against the onslaught, but also you've got to be you've got to be proactive and you've got to go on the offense. Look, you can't win any game if you play only defense. You can't win any battle if all you do is defend. So how do you go on the offense against anti-Semitism? There's one way to do that, and that is by driving a philo-Semitic narrative that that teaches and that inculcates and breeds a, a, an understanding of and an appreciation of and a respect of the Jewish story of Jewish history and the profound and indelible contributions of the Jewish people to civilization and to every country where there has been a Jewish community. You know, you cannot tell the history of the United States without talking about those values that we see in our Declaration of Independence that come right from, from, Jew, from the values of Judaism. You can't tell the history of England or of Germany or France or Russia or Poland without talking about the profound contributions of the Jewish communities to those, to those countries. And so we're working feverishly to turn the tables on anti-Semitism and not only defend against it, but to go on the offense. I'll give you two examples. Next year, year 2021, Germany will commemorate 1,700 years of Jewish history in Germany. And so we're working with our German interlocutors to inject content into that. So it's not just a declaration in January and then you move on, but to actually develop a curriculum that will be driven into every classroom in every city in Germany so that every single kid knows it's 1700 years and not only the number, but knows a little bit about the content of those years. You know, I, I asked our German friends, you know, how many German kids know? Never mind the, the Jewish influences on Germany, but vice versa. How many German kids know that the vernacular language of Ashkenazi Judaism from Russia to England is a form of German? The answer is nobody knows that. And so the question is, let's get serious. Why does no one know? Let's get serious about fighting anti-Semitism. And now let me bring it right here at home. The month of May is Jewish American Heritage Month. In fact, this has been declared by every single president of the United States for 40 years. From, from 1980 to, to 2006, it was, it was Jewish Heritage Week. From 2006 to today, Jewish American Heritage Month. Now, I've been around the country talking about this. The number of people who know about this, have even heard about Jewish American Heritage Month, I can count on two hands. Why is that? If we're serious about combating anti-Semitism, how can we not use this vehicle created for us, delivered on a silver platter, meant to do exactly this, to teach our fellow Americans about the Jewish people and Jewish history and Jewish contributions. How can we not grasp it and run with it and make, it the, make the most of it? And so we have uh, launched an initiative called the Jewish Heritage Initiative. I'm proud to say we launched this with, with incredible partner organizations uh, to capture and realize the potential of Jewish American Heritage Month uh, so that we can go on the offense against anti-Semitism. Those are our priorities. I wanna leave you with some good news because you know, we, uh, we focus on a lot of bad news and you know what, there is bad news and it's important to focus on it, but, but there's also a lot of good news. A piece of good news, number one, is that we have a lot of amazing partners around the world, allies who get it, who understand 
that anti-Semitism isn't only a threat to Jews, but anti-Semitism is a threat to civilization itself. We have European interlocutors at all levels from heads of government to ministers, to parliamentarians, to anti-Semitism coordinators who ask, how is it possible on the continent where the Holocaust was perpetrated, how is it possible that anti-Semitism would be, would be rising today? And they're appalled by it. And they are champions of this cause, not just allies, not just allies, they're champions of this cause. And it is my great privilege to work with them every single day. In fact, I was just on, a, on a, um, uh, uh, an international conference with some of my, uh, my colleagues who, who are just doing great work and, and uh, fighting against the scourge of Jew hatred. Piece of good news number two is that there is a state of Israel. The Jewish people do have self-determination and the Jewish state of Israel is a, a beacon for humanity, a model for the world of democracy and tolerance and inter-ethnic inter and interfaith faith uh, freedoms and, uh, and, and freedom of the press and world-changing innovation and a military that is, that is strong and yet committed to the rule of law, Israel's strength makes the Jewish people stronger everywhere in the world and better able to combat the scourge of anti-Semitism. And finally, finally, piece of good news number three is that the United States of America, despite rising anti-Semitism, even right here, you know, we just, celebra we just commemorated the horrific uh, two-year anniversary of, of the massacre at Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue. Um, and you know, a year ago on October 27th, I arrived in Halle, Germany to visit the scene of that synagogue attack on Yom Kippur. And I chose October 27th to make the point through conduct, not only through words, that this, this horrific a scourge of Jew hatred is a global problem that requires a global solution. But despite rising anti-Semitism, even right here at home, the United States of America is still the most philo-Semitic country in the history of the world. Every poll shows that Jews aren't simply tolerated here. Jews are embraced and treasured in the United States. And the state of Israel is loved among ordinary Americans from coast to coast. And we have to keep it that way. And the United States today is led by the most philo-Semitic administration we have ever had. From President Trump to Vice President Pence to my boss, Secretary Pompeo, and the entire leadership team, we've never seen anything like this. Look, we are confronting simultaneously the Jew haters on the far right and on the radical left and from militant Islam. Let me give you some examples. We're the first administration ever to designate a violent white supremacist group as a terrorist organization. Never been done before, we did it. President Trump signed into law the historic Never Again Education Act to ensure that future generations of American school children will learn about the Holocaust and understand what happens when far right Nazi type ethnic supremacy anti-Semitism is on the rise. To confront the anti-Semitism of the far left, which of course, finds its safest space on university campuses, including at our most elite institutions. President Trump last December issued an executive order that applies Title VI protections to Jewish students, basically protecting besieged Jewish students on campuses. I was there when he signed that order. He, uh, uh, after signing it at the White House, he looked right at the cameras and said, let me make this very clear. If you are a university, and you are promoting the harassment and discrimination of your Jewish students, you are gonna lose a lot of money. This is gonna be very expensive for you, he said. And I can tell you, there's not a single university president or chancellor uh, anywhere in America that didn't hear that loud and clear. And so we are taking unprecedented steps to confront the, the deluge of anti-Semitism on American college campuses and on global college campuses. And so President Trump has done that. And then finally, to stand against the anti-Semitism that comes from militant Islam that focuses most of all on Israel hatred, this administration has stood with the state of Israel like no other. It has been an unprecedented commitment to strengthening and supporting and protecting and championing the state of Israel. From closing the PLO office in Washington, DC, to defunding 
UNRWA so that our tax money doesn't go to printing anti-Semitic textbooks? How appalling is that to teach beautiful, innocent children to hate other children? Not with our tax money anymore, thanks to President Trump. He said, no, no, we're not going to pay for that. Defunding the PAs, the Palestinian Authority's pay for slave program, where US tax money, hardworking Americans, their tax money was going to pay monthly stipends to killers, to murderers who killed, who killed Jews and killed Americans for no reason other than who they were. Not with US tax money anymore. Recognizing, of course, the eternal and undivided capital of the Jewish people in the state of Israel, Jerusalem. President Trump did that and moved our embassy there, recognizing uh, Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, declaring that, that Jewish towns in Judea and Samaria are not per se violations of international law, a game changer. Recognizing through the vision of peace uh, that was proposed by the president, an unprecedented uh, a plan, detailed plan, uh, to produce peace between Israel and, and the Palestinians, recognizing the Jewish, the historic Jewish ties to Judea and Samaria. Of course, of course, brokering historic and incredible peace agreements between Israel and Arab states. I was at the signing at the White House of the Abraham Accords. Let me tell you an amazing story. A senior delegate of one of the Arab countries, I don't want to say who it is because it was a private conversation, ran up to me and said, and said, let me tell you, we are going to do great things together. He was exuberant. And he said, don't think this will be a cold peace. This is not going to be a cold peace. We will do great things together. And his exuberance, I tell you, moved me to the core. This is a new world and a new Middle East we're seeing. Peace with the UAE, peace with Bahrain, peace with Sudan, more countries on the way, an agreement that we just negotiated with, with the, uh, the kingdom of Bahrain's global Hamad center to fight anti-Semitism in the Middle East. It's a new Middle East, thanks to the leadership of President Trump and the peace team and my boss, Secretary Pompeo. And then finally, of course, walking out of the, the catastrophic and the disgraceful JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal. We spent eight years empowering our enemies and weakening our friends. And of course, of course, it didn't bring us peace. Today, we are standing by our friends unequivocally and unabashedly, and we are imposing punishing sanctions on the world's chief state sponsor of both terrorism and anti-Semitism. And so my friends, there is a lot of good news. Great things are happening in the world and the world is changing as a response to an incredible American leadership. And thanks to that leadership, uh, we are rolling back the scourge of anti-Semitism. If we create those partnerships, if we continue to advance the policies we're advancing, if we build those relationships across the United States and across the world, I have no doubt that we will be able to roll back this terrible rise in anti-Semitism and truly build for our children and for our grandchildren that better and safer and more just world that they so richly deserve truly Tikun olam b'malchut shaddai, repairing the world under the sovereignty of the Almighty. I know that when we do our work, we can always count on the ZOA to be our partner and to stand with us shoulder to shoulder and arm in arm as we fight for a just and better world. Thank you so much for everything you do and thank you for having me tonight. And I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Special Envoy Card, not just for your brilliant words, but also for the work that you do with the administration tirelessly every single day fighting for the Jewish people. I would like to start off with a question that we had from the Young Professional Committee. So you mentioned Title VI and ZOA campus and the Center for Law and Justice and ZOA as a whole um, was not just instrumental in pushing forward title, the Title VI and protecting Jewish students on college campuses, but still we're filing Title VI complaints and every day we're making sure that students are as safe as possible on college campuses. With that being said, do you have any advice on what, on what young professionals can do after college? Is there any legislation that protects us in the workplace? Can we still use Title VI in other institutions that are not colleges and universities? So first of all, that's a great question, Marlene. First, so first of all, let me say that, that discrimination and harassment is not protected speech. And so absolutely, there are laws in the books 
that allow anybody subjected to discrimination and harassment to, to stand up and, and fight back. And that is something we've got to do. But another thing young professionals can do, not only in, in your workplace, but when it comes to students, you know, so many students don't know what their rights are. And a key part of this, as you mentioned yourself, is ensuring that, that, that young Jewish Americans are educated on what anti-Semitism is so that they can recognize it when they see it, and on what their rights are when they're subjected, not to protected hate speech, but when they're subjected to real harassment and discrimination. I mean, you know, the cases are all over the country. You know, USC, it's amazing. This is a, a campus where, where for many, many years there was none of this stuff. And now you've got student leaders run out of town. I mean, they are, they are literally driven from elected office because they're proud Jews. Um, you know what that is? That's anti-Semitism. That's what that is. It's very simple. We've got to call it out. We've got to really uh, make sure that, that Jews, uh, first of all, are, are protected when they're, when they're discriminated against legally, but then also are supported. Even when it's protected hate speech and there isn't a legal remedy, there still can be condemnation and there still can be support. And so really young professionals, especially that are, that are closer in time to the, to the college to the, the time of campus and college life, can I think provide such important support uh, to students who desperately need support and know, need to know that, that uh, you know, professionals in our communities are standing with them and, and, and are ready and able to devote, res devote resources to uh, helping them fight back against, against this, uh, this awful climate, awful climate on, on college campuses. Thank you so much for that answer. I'm now going to start reading some questions and taking some questions for from the audience. So sure. the first question that we had is, do you have any advice on best practices to fight Holocaust deniers, especially when that Holocaust denial comes from educators or principals of public schools potentially? Well, one thing I would say is never debate a Holocaust denier. You know, that <clears throat> we've had Many examples. I mean, you know, Alan Dershowitz and others who re who refuse to debate Holocaust deniers because debating such a thing is is to accord it legitimacy. Anyone who denies or distorts the Holocaust is either either abysmally ignorant uh, or, in almost every case, uh, influenced by movements of hate. It is anti-Semitism to to minimize, distort, deny the Holocaust, and so we've got to say. You know, we've got to stand up and say, how dare you? Anyone who says that, we've got to, the response has to be, how dare you? How dare you trivialize the greatest evil ever perpetrated in history, which wasn't that long ago. The Nazi crematoria cooled 75 years ago. We liberated Auschwitz 75 years ago this year. And so we've got to stand up and say, how dare you commit a second injustice on the 6 million victims and on the survivors and on their descendants today. How dare you do that? And you should absolutely, anybody who says that has to be met with, with the most unequivocal condemnation to say, listen, if you are denying the evil that was perpetrated so recently against the Jewish people, then you are, you are in partnership with that evil. That has to be the message. Thank you so, so much for that answer. Um, the next question that we had is in regards to the new mandatory ethics study program that is being implemented by CSUs. Um, can you speak a little bit more on how you see that promoting anti-Semitism and the, what will the effects of that be in the long term with such a curriculum? Well, for sure. Let me tell you the background. A year ago in the summer when the first version of this curriculum was proposed, um, I, in my role as special envoy, condemned it publicly. And, and I can tell you, you know, to condemn a domestic US educational curriculum is not an easy thing. I mean, the Department of Education was involved, but we were all so appalled. Um, you know, I, I will tell you that when I, when I first was told about this, it was so appalling, I thought it was a hoax. I didn't think it was real until I actually went through and read this, this Soviet curriculum, this this unvarnished indoctrination of American children, not only against, against the, the Jewish people in the state of Israel, but really against America. I mean, this was a, this was a, a, a neo-socialist, neo-Marxist agenda 
um, driven into schools. And thankfully, thankfully, they withdrew that curriculum uh, under enormous pressure. And, and so they, they tweaked it. They made it a little bit less offensive. And then they tried to have a second bite at the apple. Well, uh, first of all, I want to say, and I want to publicly thank Governor Gavin Newsom for vetoing the bill that would have mandated that curriculum in K through 12 schools. Actually, it was high school, but in, in, in nine through 12 in, in, in California high schools, this would have been, think about it, mandated in every single public high school in the state of California. Uh, to his credit, Governor Newsom said this isn't right and vetoed it because the Jewish community, in, you know, by, in, in bipartisan fashion said, said, we cannot support this. This is a threat to us. Um, however, he did sign the law that mandated it in, in the Cal State system. And this is a real concern because, you know, universities are, are a problem already. Uh, there's so much anti-Israel, anti, anti, um, uh, anti-Zionist sentiment, and frankly, overt anti-Semitism in many cases. And, and to, to have a, a neo-Marxist curriculum, which is what this is, this is an ethnic studies. Let's be very precise what this is. This is critical ethnic studies, which is, which is an absolute I mean, direct influence of, of Marxist uh, uh, social thought uh, brought into America's uh, high institutions of higher education. And it is, uh, it is a real problem. It will absolutely lead to an increase in anti-Semitism uh, and we've got to oppose it. The law is all, already the law, but we, we absolutely can fight the content and demand that the content be withdrawn like it was a year ago. So that, that uh, is something that, that I look forward to uh, seeing a lot of great organizations doing. A lot of great organizations are, are very, very involved. In, uh, in reshaping this curriculum. And it's deeply, deeply important that we do so. Great, thank you so much for that insight. Um, we had another question that goes as follows. There have been some reports from groups that most of the Jew hatred comes from white supremacist movements. Do you agree that that's the case? And if not, what would you say is the largest source of Jew hatred? And continuing on the theme, how should we best combat it? So when I uh, took this appointment, uh, nearly two years ago, our um, um, mantra was we will not ignore any part of the ideological spectrum when it comes to Jew hatred. Um, whether it comes from the, you know, the, the ethnic supremacist far right, whether it comes from the, the, the radical left venomous against Israel and, and, and Jewish people and Zionism, or whether it comes from militant Islam, they're all dangerous. They're all bad. And the fact of the matter is Jew hatred is Jew hatred. Who cares what ideological clothing it wears? We have to combat all of it. It's been a, a big regret to see early on, especially when, when, you know, in 2019, after I took the appointment, to see so many organizations minimizing or refusing to acknowledge um, one or another kind of anti-Semitism. And I think it's deeply important that we acknowledge all of it and combat all of it. You know, look, if you leave two thirds or even one third of a tumor untreated, the patient doesn't do well. So if you're serious about combating anti-Semitism, you gotta fight all of it. Um, now you ask me what the greatest source is, I don't know that you can rank it. Um, I'll tell you for those people um, in Pittsburgh's Tree of Life Synagogue uh, two years and two days ago, um, I know what they'll say the greatest source of anti-Semitism is, they'll say the far right. It, it, took their lives and it took the lives of those survivors would tell you it, it took the lives of people standing next to me. Same thing. I spoke at the funeral of Lori Kay, Zichon Ali in, in Poway, uh, murdered um, on Shabbat in synagogue um, by a, a far right white supremacist. Um, and so, you know, you know what they'll tell you or the people in Halle or, or the people around, around the world who've seen these neo-Nazi far right movements flourish. Um, and take to the streets in many cases, torchlit marches filled with venom and hate. Um, but talk to uh, talk to any Jew in the United Kingdom. Ask ask Jews in the United Kingdom, especially before the election, what's the greatest threat to your to the survival of the Jewish community? They're not going to tell you the far right. They will tell you the left, the radical left. The fact that the radical left could hijack a major political party in the United Kingdom. And you know, it was such a great moment of Jewish unity when the Jewish community put, put partisanship aside. They put 
um, uh, aside any division, whether it was left or right, uh, Ashkenazi, Sfaradi, Mizrahi, observant or secular, young, old, they put all of it aside and they stood together and said, enough is enough. Uh, we will not accept what this cabal in the Labour Party back then represented. And they said, this threatens our survival. This threatens the, the, continu the continuity of the, of the Jewish community in Great Britain. And so that was the far left. Now talk to, uh, talk to Jews in many parts of Western Europe who are subjected to constant attacks by, uh, by uh, radicalized uh, uh, is communities, militant Islamism. They'll tell you that's the greatest threat. So I think it is counterproductive to rank them or to say which is worse than the other. I think, I think it, is a, it, it can be a great moment of unity for the global Jewish community and for the global community to say that all of it is bad and that Jew hatred is Jew hatred and that we are gonna confront all of it because all of it threatens the Jewish people and all of it threatens uh, civilization itself. Thank you so much. I would like to bring another question from the Young Professional Committee to your attention. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen many elected officials, including ones in New York, use Jewish communities as scapegoats uh, for what's going on, not to mention any names in particular. Um, so I was just wondering, other than showing up and voting and speaking with our votes, is there anything else that young Jews that feel disenfranchised can do to speak out on on these leaders? Well, yes, speaking out is critically important. You know, uh, thank God in America, you know, we, we can uh, make our voices heard and we can protest, right? As long as it's peaceful and a real protest and not, not uh, uh, what, what we've seen on, the, on our, the streets of our cities, you know, torching our, our cities and our businesses and our communities. But a real protest, um, we absolutely have the right to do that. And whether we're, whether we're protesting um, unfair uh, uh, singling out of the Jewish community or whether we're protesting uh, rising anti-Semitism, um, we absolutely have a right to make our voices heard. And I think it's critically important that, uh, that all of us, all Americans do that. Because like I said, anti-Semitism isn't only a threat to Jews. Anti-Semitism stands against the very DNA of the United States of America. It is, it opposes uh, the very, the, the core being and the, and the key foundational values on which our great country was built. You know, uh, some people uh, who, who hide behind uh, uh, various uh, cloak, their Jew hatred, need to know that, you know, America is better. You know, we, our founding fathers fled um, the, the bloodletting and the blood libels of the old world. They came here to build, to build a country that was, that was free and prosperous and that embraced uh, its Jewish community and its other communities. And so that's what America stands for. And so all Americans have to stand up and fight against this, this scourge because this scourge uh, will surely, um, uh, if allowed to, undermine uh, our great country. So we've got to root it out and stomp it out. In a very similar tone, I would like to ask the question of national board member Len Getz. Um, how would we fight anti-Semitism of US political leaders on a national level like Elon Omar and Rashida Tlaib? Well, we have elections and um, you know, if we, don't, if we don't like our elected officials, uh, we, we, we vote them out. Um, and of course, you don't have to be a constituent to get involved in a race. We all know that very well. Um, now I can't comment on on elections, and I'm not giving advice on elections because I can't do that. Uh, but but certainly I can say that uh, every American uh, has a right to be involved and to be civically active. In fact, every American should be civically active. And um, you know, and if if you feel elected officials aren't doing their job, well, you know, there's a process for for uh, expressing that. Uh, but short of elections, I think it's very very important that we call out anti-Semitism wherever we hear it. Um, you know, when we hear anti-Semitic expressions come from the halls of Congress, it's, it's appalling. And I think all of us need to, to, need to say loudly and clearly. Um, by the way, in, a, in bipartisan fashion, and this is very important, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's especially important for people on the right to call out anti-Semitism on the right. And it's especially important for people on the left to call out anti-Semitism on the left. 
um, that establishes credibility and, and sincerity in the fight against anti-Semitism. And so I think it's very, very important that, that, that all of us, uh, when we hear anti-Semitic expressions, we call it out. And uh, whether it comes from here or from there, and certainly when it, when it comes from, from the halls of, of Congress. But th thank God, by the way, the, the names you mentioned, these are rare exceptions. I wanna say that, you know, I've had the great privilege of, of working across the aisle. Um, of course, I work with, with, uh, with Republicans in, in the Senate and the House who are, who are champions of our cause. But I have to tell you, um, every day I work with, uh, with incredible Democratic leaders who are champions of this cause, who get it, um, who understand it, and who are fighting anti-Semitism every day. You know, look, there's a, there's a Senate and a House bipartisan task force on fighting anti-Semitism, both chambers. Um, the Senate, the Senate uh, bipartisan task force on anti-Semitism just celebrated its one year anniversary. It was founded a year ago by, uh, by uh, Senator James, by Senator Jackie Rosen and Senator James Langford. Um, and uh, and uh, I work with them all the time and they're really champions of this cause. And in the house too, we have great bipartisan support. I just had the great privilege of, uh, of talking about anti-Semitism with, with one of our great uh, uh, leaders, Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey, who's been terrific. And so it's very important we acknowledge that, that um, the fight against Jew hatred uh, has got to stay bipartisan. And, uh, and when anybody in either party violates uh, that rule and, and starts to spout anti-Semitism, you know, there was a Republican congressman who did that and, and the Republican uh, majority took, uh, the Republican caucus took action against that congressman. It's very, very important that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we reject clearly and unequivocally um, any kind of expression of anti-Semitism, especially uh, in, uh, in uh, positions of leadership. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, we also had some questions when you were speaking before about um, Holocaust education and that becoming hmm. mandated by this administration in, in public schools across the country. It seems that oftentimes the Holocaust is taught in a vacuum and without the mention of the state of Israel. Do you think that it is important to connect Israel and the Holocaust and Israel to the Jewish people? And if so, are there any plans to somehow mandate that into the curriculums as well? Well, I don't think there is a plan to mandate that into the curriculum, but the Never Again Education Act, again, a, a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenal achievement, legislatively uh, supported through bipartisan work and and signed into law by President Trump, one of the great achievements of this administration to ensure uh, that generations of American kids are going to know about the Holocaust, especially at a time when I don't know if you saw the recent surveys, the claims. Uh, the Claims Commission survey and the AJC poll that shows that many Americans, um, I should say more and more Americans, don't know about the Holocaust. And so this comes at an absolutely critical time. I don't think there's a plan to mandate the content of that curriculum, but it's deeply important that the Holocaust be taught the right way. And that education not be about only the Holocaust. I talked about philo-Semitism before. You know, the Jewish people, are about so much more than persecution, you know. And if 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 there's a, an effort, unintentional, of course, but in in, a, in effect reducing the Jewish people and the Jewish history to a story of of hate and persecution, what a grave injustice that would be to the Jewish people. And so I think it is deeply important that anti-Semitism, that educating about anti-Semitism, of course, the Holocaust is the the, the sort of the center point of, of an ex the exhibit A of anti-Semitism, but anti-Semitism has been going on for millennia, that anti-Semitism be only one aspect of, of the education that we need to create and the curricula that we need to craft. That's why I talk about an education in philo-Semitism being so deeply important. Uh, understanding what the Jewish people are, what the Jewish story is, how the story of the Jewish people played a direct role in the founding of the United States, in the contents of the Declaration of Independence, in the, the mission of the United States over the years in, in terms of how we've defined that mission globally, and in the, in the constant contributions made um, by Jewish values to the, to the American spiritual DNA. 
That is so very important because when you do that, suddenly anti-Semitism and the, ed and, and the education that we need to deliver in anti-Semitism becomes that much deeper. It's not only a history lesson. Suddenly it becomes about showing how anti-Semites and haters are in effect rejecting the Jewish people and the Jewish story and Jewish contributions, right? That's what anti-Semitism really is. It is in effect a, a, a spiritual sickness that ultimately amounts to a rejection of basic Jewish concepts like ethical monotheism and, and, and an idea of, of, uh, of, uh, of you know, what, what the Jewish people have brought. But you can't really understand that unless you first develop and craft an education in philo-Semitism, which is why that is so deeply important. And so, yes, I think while there are no plans to mandate that, I think there has to be a connection. Jewish history, the Jewish people, Jewish peoplehood, of course, the realization of that in, uh, in the founding of the, of the state of Israel has to be um, the story. And then anti-Semitism has to be seen as a rejection of, uh, of, of what the Jewish message has always been for humanity. Thank you so much. And as our hour is coming to an end, I would just like if it was possible for you to leave us young professionals with some parting words, words of advice, what can we do on, on our journeys to fighting anti-Semitism to, you know, the future leaders of the Jewish people, the next generation, what should we be doing? What should we be working on? Well, that is the question. And I, I can't thank you enough, Marlene, for ending with that. You know, the reason why I'm here, I, I, you know, Alan and I just spoke, we, I just did a ZOA program not too long ago. Um, it's not common for me to, to do a, a second program with the same organization, but, but because this is a young professionals uh, group and focused on this, um, I thought it was especially important for me to spend time with you because you are the future. What is happening in, in the community of American, um, America's young people, right? youth, students, and young professionals will absolutely determine the kind of future that we will have. And if we really are to bequeath to the next generation a, a future of which, of, which they, of which they are worthy, the future that they are, of which they are worthy, then we've got to invest in you. And we have to make sure that, that in your communities, the, the right priorities are driven, that you have the support that you need, that you know how important that you are. And, and that's the message that I have for you. And so what I would say is, first of all, number one, increase activism. We have got to have young professionals um, at a time when frankly, there is a lot of apathy among millennials. We've got to have young professionals understand the urgency of the times we're in. We really are in urgent times. America, um, you know, is that a fork in the road where there are two dramatically different visions of our future? The Jewish people stand at a fork in, in the road as well, where there is a, is a dramatically different understanding of, of what the role of the Jewish people will be in, 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 in the world and in our future. This is a critical time. And so, so activism now is, is urgently needed, not tomorrow, not next week, but now is when it's needed. And so you are the, the emissaries of that message. Nobody else can say that more clearly to young professionals than young professionals. And so when you're confronting you know, the notorious apathy we see, not in, not in this crowd, of course, but, but we see in our communities around us, nobody is better equipped to combat that apathy, to, to shake people out of that atrophy uh, then, then are you when you go to your, to your, to your friends and your colleagues and your coworkers and and people of your age group and say, what are you doing? You know, look, uh, you know, in these urgent times, um, choices will be made that will be in many cases irrevocable. And at one point in our future. It might be in five years, it might be in 10, it might be in 20, but at one point, each and every one of us will be held to account for the actions that we took today. It might be our children, it might be our grandchildren, but we will be asked, Ima Abba, Saba Safta, 
What did you do? When anti-Semitism was on the rise, when the state of Israel was vilified, when the Islamic Republic of Iran denied the Holocaust while at the same time promising to perpetrate the next one and wipe the Jewish people out, when we saw America riven by factionalism and some of those factions standing up and expressing open and unvarnished anti-Semitism, what did you do then? God forbid, God forbid, should we not have an answer to that future generation, to posterity's question of what we did today. It is my prayer that we will always have an answer of which we can be proud. And that is up to you. That is up to you to, to carry forth that message of urgency, to motivate everyone around you, and to find common purpose, to confront anti-Semitism, but also to champion American values, the values that made the United States of America the greatest country in the history of the world. Now is the time to champion those values. And I know that with great young leaders like you, our future is truly bright. I'm, I'm optimistic, and you're the ones who make me optimistic. So thank you. May you go from strength to strength. Chazak uvaruch. Thank you for what you do, and thank you so much for having me. Amen. Thank you so, so much, Special Envoy Carr, for joining us today, for leading us through this discussion, for your words of wisdom and empowerment and advice. We so really appreciate you. So a big thank you from the entire ZOA family. Thank you so much to all of those that joined us today. If you are a young professional, we do ask that you stay on for a little social. After this, we would love to get to know you and to meet you and to tell you about our upcoming events and programming. ZOA really does such, such important work through all its departments, through outreach, through our Center of Law and Justice, government relations, campus, but none of this would be possible without your support. So all your donations go directly toward helping fight anti-Semitism and fighting for the Jewish people. You can donate at zoa.org. Thank you so much again to all of you that joined us today. And another huge thank you to Special Envoy Elon Carr and to all the young professionals out there. We're looking forward to meeting you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for having me.